Welcome back to uh, EBC's Brain Talks, the podcast series that is organized by the European Brain Council under the umbrella of the Brain Innovation Days. In today's episode, we are diving deeper into the discussions held during the last Brain Innovation Days digital session on fast-tracking brain innovation in times of COVID-19. This session took a different look at the ongoing pandemic, attempting a positive spin on impact seen by COVID-19, particularly within the innovation space. We explored the positive direct and indirect results of the pandemic response and increased research on the brain innovation ecosystem. What lessons can be learned, what advancements have been made, and what trust lay ahead. When addressing how the brain community was forced to shift and adapt to the pandemic, we were pleased to welcome Dr. Mathilde Leonardi to provide an intervention on her capacity as a neurologist, director of the Italian WHO Collaborating Center research brand, and as part of the, of the WHO NeuroCovid Forum. Welcome, Dr. Leonardi. And Mathilde, during the event, you were able to give us a, a preliminary insight into the work the WHO is doing through the NeuroCovid Forum to explore the effects of COVID-19 in the neurological space on patients and in healthcare services in general. And today we are pleased to welcome you back to learn more about this important work. So I will be your moderator, Frédéric Destrebeck, the Executive Director of EBC, a founding partner of the Brain Innovation Days. Let's get started then. Um, so Mathilde, um, can you tell us more a little bit about what this WHO NeuroCovid for Forum uh, actually represents and what is your role as part of the working groups that are uh, set up under these ages? Yes, thank you. Last year, when it was February, the beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, the first paper from Professor Mao, a Chinese colleague, was firstly describing on the 28th of February the some symptoms on an old 67-year-old man in China who had uh, the, these uh, neurological signs. That was the first appearance of uh, neurological signs. I work in Milano at the National Neurological Institute, and I was reading everything. I was curious about these strange epidemics. We didn't know what was that. But when I saw that paper, I called the colleagues of the WHO Brain Health Unit, Tarun Dua, the director of that unit, and uh, we discussed, we were the second country, as you know, Italy was affected immediately after China and Bergamo, Brescia and the country and the cities near me were starting to report about these cases. The first Italian case was on the 28th of February, in fact, and then we started. And then when we spoke with the WHO unit, it was clear that this virus was presenting not only respiratory symptoms, but other symptoms that were not clear at that moment. And we started to... Uh, going deep. And immediately, my colleague from Brescia, Professor Padovani, with whom I moved because I was seconded there for some months, we were registering uh, neurological cases and we were reporting them to WHO. It was not easy to get information from China at that moment, so we were mostly providing. Immediately after, in the 15, 20 days after the beginning of Italian reporting, of course, also the French, the Spanish, and then the British were starting to report, and more and more, the time was passing, more and more neurological symptoms were clear. It was then that the WHO brain unit was calling the neurologists from the WHO centers, collaborating centers, and from other centers to please report to the WHO what was happening, because this was not clear, and most of the governments were discussing about the respiratory symptoms. So neurological were not at the center of the stage but it was clear after one month that the neurology was very much involved, not necessarily the brain, but there was a series of symptoms that were very much connected. And it was in that moment that WHO decided to convene this uh, NeuroCovid forum, meaning that we are now, uh, since uh, uh, March 2020, 85 neurologists from all over the world, Many of us working in the WHO centers, but also others that are key leaders in uh, their own country for the neurological observation of what is happening. We were divided in four groups. One was dealing with the acute symptoms, one was dealing with the epidemiology, and one was dealing with the uh, long term, which is something that uh, came very much after because we started to have that 
let's say, discussing more closely about October. And I was nominated together with a colleague from Tunisia, uh, Professor Shannetz, that is the director of the Child Neurology Clinic in um, Tunis. We were uh, elected, we were nominated chairs of the um, Neurological Disruption and Mitigation Services uh, Evaluation. Uh, with my group, so we are members of all the four groups, but each of us has specific responsibilities. With our group, which is composed of neurologists from Russia, Argentina, Brazil, India, and uh, South Africa, and uh, Morocco, as well as uh, Germany and uh, UK, meaning it's a group that is reporting and uh, the different moments of this incredible year has been also facing us with reporting, direct reporting of the colleagues that were observing what was happening in their own country. So it was, we meet twice per week since March last year. So we have, uh, ed, every group is meeting alone and then the four groups meet every two weeks. So we have a live reporting of the neuro neurological situation in the world every week. And uh, what was striking us that at the beginning, the WHO was, for example, doing some pulse survey, meaning very quickly survey about uh, the service disruption. The first one was done in June 2020 and it was in general, it was not concentrated at all on the neurological services. There was not a word about what was happening to neurological services, despite chronic patients in the world are mostly neurological patients and the burden of disease tells us this. So we were looking at this WHO report and we were saying, but where is the neurological services? We have uh, the acute care, the neurological, chronic care, the rehabilitation, all of that was in a sense very much shaded, faded in the report. So the Division of Mental Health uh, decided to call all the regional and the uh, country advisor and asking about a survey of mental, neurological and substance abuse disorders. This came out in August 2020. But also there, there was an issue for neurology because most of the advisors at country level, they were reporting about mental health. And as you know, mental health services uh, present very different characteristics because they're dealing with uh, psychiatric patients. They have a different type of uh, uh, organization and also the substance abuse. They were not matching with the need for neurological patients. So that was the reason why with the uh, survey group and with the Shannet and with all our team, we decided to go on and do two things. The first was a literature review, what was published in the world. And uh, then we started to do that uh, because also then the second report of the WHO Pulse survey came out in October, uh, taking some inputs from uh, uh, our group, meaning that we were able to know in October that in the global, let's say, WHO, that neuro, acute neurosurgery was affected and many services were moving from like in a spoken hub system so that they were concentrating neurosurgery uh, somewhere. Um, most of the essential services were not disrupted. The acute care was not really disrupted. But there was no news about what is happening to the chronic neurological patients and what is happening to the patients that are developing neurological symptoms due to COVID. That was like a gray fog. There was no news in October. So we performed, a, um, according to the WHO request, a survey, a systematic review, uh, in which we were looking what is the scientific community publishing. Because at that point in October, we had all the countries affected. So while in March and April it was mostly China and Europe, when we were in October, we had all the world mostly affected. And at that moment, we are, we are having Brazil very much severely affected, as now we are having India, that is the country with the highest number. Southeast Asia now is very, very much affected, despite some countries of Southeast Asia are performing very well, Singapore, Taiwan, and others. But there are some countries that are really, really affected. For those that we have news, we have some countries we have no news, so we are not really having precise information. But in the review, there were more than 1,000 papers reporting about neurological problems. But these papers were mostly written by uh, 
scientific community. So it was like doctors or university people or researchers reporting what was happening to them. We were completely missing like a governmental perspective of what was happening to neurological. And we thought, well, in a sense, it's a bit different. Also because since uh, the beginning of the pandemics, patients' neurological association were very, very, very alarmed and preoccupied. Why this? For several reasons. At the beginning of the pandemic in many countries, and I would like to say also in countries like European countries and US, the lack of uh, emergency uh, device for respiratory was making a sort of complete discrimination that may not have been true for many countries, but at the beginning, the impression was that if there are not so many respiratory issues for all, then those who already had a, health, a pre-existing health condition will not be uh, put at first if we do not have enough respiratory uh, device for all. This created an enormous alarm. And in June 2020, the EFNA, the European Federation of Neurological Association, together with the European Chronic Disease Alliance, were launching incredible alarms from the patient perspective. They were saying, nobody's listening to us. We cannot be discriminated because of having a neurological condition, because this will make us like a class B category of patient compared to the others. So we were having the patients that were screaming out that they were discriminated, and we were having the government who were not reporting about neurological situation. And this was around October, November 2020. And the scientific community was reporting about disruption and mitigation from the doctors or nurses or specialist perspective, which is not necessarily the full picture, but it was another angle. So we have the governments, we have the patients, and then we have the scientific community. And in the three areas, in any case, we have the shouting of patients. They were very much scared. In some, uh, I am sorry to say this, but in some uh, U.S. states, some government governors were even saying that if you have a disease, for example, like autism, which is not neurological, but uh, Parkinson's disease or other disease, you are not, you will not be given any respiratory uh, support. And this was written in some US states up front. This was creating, and for me, working for the last 20 years on human rights issues related to, to patients and access and equality and uh, fighting inequality, uh, it was like opening doors that we were not expecting that really needed to be opened again. So that shout of patients could not be left uh, alone. And the WHO has been listening to that. And particularly, I would say, European Federation of Neurological Association, which is the only in the world. Uh, th there is no other, uh, let's say, regional like US uh, patients association. So ethna so far, is one of the broadest and most powerful voice because it groups uh, the largest number of neurological patients association. They were so worried. They were writing to everybody. They were writing to WHO. And within the Federation of Neurological Association, some patients group were even more scared than others. We were receiving incredible letters from uh, family members who were saying, what do I do? If my husband, who has Parkinson, is going to get the disease, we were receiving breaking into tears letters from uh, presidents of patients' associations saying we are unable to reassure our patient. And in this sense, it was like, okay, there was the emergency going, and the governments were doing their best because this was unknown for everybody. But on the other hand, it was like, where is all these patients? To whom do they speak? So, for example, the neuro-oncological patients in most of the countries of the world, they were kept the oncological treatment. So they were rearranged the way in which the drugs were provided. And I have also to distinguish the first way and the second way. The first way was when everything came. So let's say from February to May, most of the countries had the first way, to which we were completely unprepared. 
Um, and I would say there that uh, the European Academy of Neurology and the World Federation of Neurology, particularly the European Academy of Neurology, because Europe was first touch before the rest of the world. So the European Academy of Neurology, by pressure of groups like the one led by Ettore Beghi, who is Italian, because we were having this, so we were pushing and pushing because we were needing answers from the international community. And uh, so the European Academy of Neurology made a large European service in what's happening. That was May, June 2020. So we were having some feedback from neurologists. Um, but there was a lack of communication on what to do. Uh, May 2020, the American Academy of Neurology made a very intelligent uh, tool. They uh, made their online neurological examination. They were providing how to do the online neurological examination. So that was something that everybody started to use because the online was coming as a solution from the beginning to replace the face-to-face -face visit. But of course, this could not work all over. When we were doing the first review about service disruption, majority of papers were published uh, Italy, Spain, UK, US. These were the four countries out of the 1,100 papers that we found in the systematic review that were publishing. And we were, of course, missing majority of the work. So this was not giving us a real idea of service disruption because these countries are countries in high income countries level where the neurological services are in place. I mean, the, so you can disrupt something that is already there. As a group of the WHO Forum, we were interested to know what is happening in the remaining two-thirds of the world when neurological services were not so much in place even before the COVID. This is why, together with the European Federation of Neurological Association, we put up a survey, a global survey, on the disruption and mitigation of services. What we did is that we identified all the uh, international organizations that are in official relationship with WHO and we looked for all the others. We came out with 40 international global uh, neurological organizations. So is the International League Against Epilepsy. So we took scientific and patients global and we came out with 40 uh, associations. We called all the presidents. And we told them we need to have pictures. Governments have no idea how to do things for neurological patients. Because at the governmental level, the advisor of the WHO are for the 90% mental health people. So they don't advise for neurological uh, services. They were advising about mental health services, which then was leaving the neurological information completely unknown to governments. So what we did is we call these presidents and we say, okay, we do a survey and we want this survey bottom up. So you please ask the presidents of your association to respond from the neurological, the child neurology, the neurorehabilitation, the neurosurgery, the neurophysiology, the neuroradiology perspective. What is happening from a bottom up approach to the neurological services? So we sent out the survey we had 120 replies from presidents of national association, which brought up to have 53 countries from all the WHO regions. So it's not the 190, however, it's already enough to have an idea of what happened. And we were then confronting what the scientific review was telling us to what the, uh, let's say the, the, the ground is reporting. And um, in this ground reporting, 40% of response were coming from international patients association. And I think uh, it's important because this is complementing the scientific review in which we have no patients association voice. Because of course, in the scientific literature, you usually have doctors or uh, researchers who publish. So we were really missing what was on the other hand on the newspaper, patients claiming thing and webinars, appeals, and even the UN, the group that is working on the right of people with disability, they were also putting their voice in because people with disability worldwide, they felt we are in a, uh, let's say, 
prejudice era. I mean, this is as if Cody, COVID uh, was bringing out not willingness to discriminate, because nobody wanted to discriminate, but it was as if, okay, I have to choose. I have a normal 50-year-old man and a uh, multiple sclerosis 50-year-old man, and I cannot say both. Who do I say? Okay, I say the normal one. And this thing was coming out even from colleagues from the anesthesia and from governments who were even writing this. And this created an enormous discrimination pathway. I think it will take us years to recuperate this blessing. But, but to, to a large extent, I mean, we have said in, in, let's say, many areas that COVID has been an accelerator or I would say a revealing agent. So now what you're pointing out is, is revealing this kind of, of discrepancy or disalignment between what you said, the scientific literature, the reporting from the ground and what governments are actually deciding or, or putting in place. Uh, what is your vision as to how we can reconcile that and what are the lessons learned you know, for the future? Okay, the disruptions so were reported and they're published on the Journal of Neurology. Um, we have to say that where you did not have services before, of course, the COVID did not help. One of the most disrupted age group were children with neurological disorders because they had two burdens. Children with neurological disorders, because of the lockdowns in many, many countries, they stopped to go to school and they stopped to receive rehabilitation. Rehabilitation has been one of the most affected issues. And for many of our neurological patients, rehabilitation is really very, very important. So while drugs might have continued to go, rehabilitation was very much disrupted, as well as all the outpatient encounters. In many, many countries they were interrupted, so many people were jumping their controls on other things. Only the essential drugs were kept. And um, telemedicine became one of the answers that was put in place, but almost 90% of the governments, they were saying that the response to the needs of patients was telemedicine. Forgetting that most of our patients are quite in the aging group. So if you think Parkinson and Alzheimer's. So the, digi the digital divide was a new form of, of discrimination. So how to adapt to this adaptation that telemedicine yeah. became? So, so that was one point. And the second, yeah. it was also that in many countries, two thirds of the countries, the web is not really so much working. I just give you a small example. I was working, I mentioned my coach here is Shanes from Tunisia. She's a child a neurologist professor. And she was telling us that most of the mothers with children with neurological disabilities who are needing rehabilitation, they were doing tele-rehabilitation, but they don't have internet at home. So they were going to the supermarket where they have Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi. So we have these uh, small movies of children that they are doing rehabilitation between the uh, different parts of the supermarket because there, there is the uh, line. So the mothers with the physiotherapists on the other part of the line were doing physiotherapy in the supermarket so that they could have the line of their kids uh, to do the rehabilitation for their kids. And I mean, also the issue of modernizing. So I think that Europe can play a major role in telling how do we digitalize our countries now that we enter with this. Yeah. And the the other, yeah. The, the, the example is probably pushing the integration of services a little bit too far, I would say. So, so, but, but can Europe set an example in that respect? I mean, uh, on how, I mean, because we conducted also studies and, and surveys on how m multiple sclerosis care was, was impacted and how telemedicine was playing a role. I mean, apparently it was very much to the satisfaction of, of professionals and patients to, to a large extent. But how to work on, you mentioned uh, elderly, but uh, also other, other parts of population who do not have access to, to those digital services. How can we mitigate that in your view? There has been a report about the fact that this COVID made us make a jump in digitalization of medicine and neurology of 10 years in 12 months. So we really did a lot. And I think uh, it would be impossible to go back as before. The motto of our NeuroCOVID group is bring back better. So better means that we do not go back as before. So we keep 
all the good that was given to us by the digitalization of uh, neurocare. So we have to keep it because uh, it provided some advantages, some cost saving, as well as some new way to interact more deeply. I mean, in some African countries, if it's not telemedicine, for example, however, I have colleagues from Ghana, you have two neurologists for 90 million people. I mean, we also have to remember these kind of numbers. And what was done is that they were uh, calling people in the village. Imagine Ghana, you have to do a neurological visit. And my colleague from Ghana, she was describing, okay, you take the bus, you move from your rural village, and you take one day to go to the main hospital, and then you stay there and you queue hours, maybe one day. And then you have a 10 minute visit, and then you go back to your village. What they were doing is that they were doing telephone call and patients in some rural areas of Ghana, they were so happy, they didn't have to move, they were just having the call of the neurologists who were discussing with them the therapy. So I'm not saying that we have to go back to this, but certainly WHO is also now thinking that some of the things that came out should be kept to disseminate the neurological culture more because we have this opportunity. On the other hand, what came out very clearly is that, and this came out from the survey, 90% of the scientific and patients organization were not consulted by their own governments on what to do for uh, neurological patients, adults and children uh, in the emergency phase. And how would they have been better to put in the guidelines, in the national guidelines, information for this large amount of patients. So, one of the indications that I would take is that neurological associations have to learn on how to deal with politicians and how to make their voice to be heard. I mean, you can speak, but if you don't know the language of politics, nobody will listen to you. I think that EBC this, I think EBC knows this very, very well. So you... No, but I, I wanted to ask you, you know, how basically this phase of, of disruption that we know uh, with, with COVID for more than a year now, how does that, did that impact, uh, let's say, the, the, the strain of work of the WHO on, um, well, neurological disorders? And obviously there is no this, this proposal for the Global Action Plan on epilepsy and other neurological conditions. So how does this, these learnings from, from your work on the impact of COVID-19 can actually nurture, um, let's say, the, the, the mainstream work that, that was already engaged before, before COVID even erupted? But two things came out very clear. Uh, some of the disruption were not only related to the health services. For example, one of the things that was touching on our patient was that transportation to health was disrupted because in many countries transportation was closed. So people could not reach. So in a sense, it is as if the care of the patient is not only of the carers. So health is not just for ministries of health. This came out very clear, and this will go in the discussion in the uh, Global Action Plan uh, resolution. So health is not something just for health workers. Health is a good for a country that should be preserved, putting, in, putting the strength of all those who can work on health. And I think we in the neurological world, and I think this will go, we can work together. I mean, the issue that is now part of the debate of one neurology, putting together all those who are working in neurology into one voice. It is good, although it is difficult because every single disease might have its own specific needs and its own specific request. However, at the political level, at the global level, what should come out and what should be in the resolution and what should be done by scientific and data organization of neurological patients is that you need to, to understand what are the main needs for patients. Continuity of care, for example. It is something that came out very clearly for us and uh, that should be kept in all the countries, but also rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is a narrow rehabilitation. I mean, imagine stroke, imagine all the diseases that need rehabilitation. Rehabilitation was the most affected services that was affected everywhere because of people could not have contact with rehabilitation. So it was very good that, for example, multiple sclerosis, which is one of the most active at global level, particularly in many of the Western high income countries, uh, was already, I mean, 
many universities and many patients organizations were already ready with the digitalization of the intervention. But this makes uh, neurological intervention something that could be used by many more people in the world. I mean, I would say what brings better out of this, what should be in the resolution is that you should learn how to use the technology. So technology and innovation in the use of technology is something that will remain after COVID. And uh, we have to keep this as a, let's say, an heritage. I mean, the heritage of COVID is terrible, but now that, for example, we are coming out of the second wave in some countries and vaccination is coming, um, first of all, we have learned two things, that uh, innovation is possible and sometimes the time for innovation can be shortened. I mean, the, 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 the timing of this vaccine production is telling us that sometimes we might need less than 10 years to have a drug produced. We can have phase one, phase two, and phase three done in a shorter manner so that drugs that are produced and thought and they are in phase one could have a shorter pathway if they're really working and if they're bringing good to population. And I think this is one lesson we should very much keep as part of the heritage of COVID. If you can produce a vaccine in one year, because you use the mRNA technology that was already in place for other things, but this should remain as an heritage for production of new drugs for our patients. I mean, our patients are suffering for a long, long term from phase one to phase three. So we can learn that in one year, from phase one to phase three, it is feasible. Yeah, you, and, and, course, and, the, and there is probably also, um, let's say, being forced to, to accept innovation. I mean, when we talk about telemedicine or, or telemonitoring, there were probably also... I would I would say cultural resistance maybe sometimes to 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 have it embedded. Now the needs basically created the, uh, the, okay, the, the implementation. I, tell you, I am not millennial, so it was also a learning process for all us, the old doctors, in a sense. We are not a digitalized generation, so it was maybe easier for the digitalized generation to have this language faster. I also think that this kind of communication is sometimes limiting. A part of the doctor-patient communication that me as a neurologist I find very useful when you have, uh, I mean, as Italian I body language, you see I move my hands even in a, in a podcast, but um, there is a type of communication that cannot completely be replaced by the uh, digital manner to communicate and it is when you need some empathy beyond the screen and so I would say we have to learn that we can go back to a mixed not everything can be digitalized but many things can be digitalized so we have to learn that if this mixing is giving more services to more people this is what we need in neurology most of the countries, imagine India, I mean, I'm following the Indian situation now, okay, yesterday we had this conference with the Indian. So, 1 billion and 200,000 million people, and we were discussing how do we reach neurological patients in the villages. This was discussion with Professor Prasad, he's member of all India uh, Science Council in India, and he was telling we need something to explain to people what they have to do uh, if they have some, not only COVID symptoms, but neurological symptoms, if you have some neurological symptoms. And once we learn to reach villages because of COVID, why should we stop once COVID is finished to reach villages for providing care? So that, that was the discussion we had yesterday. Because if we are able, because of COVID, to open pathway to the remote and rural areas of India, why this should stop once the COVID will be gone? And I hope it will be gone soon, but it will take time. No, exactly, exactly. And how then to compensate uh, from your example in India or in Ghana, let's say a greater availability or, or facilitated access to, to, to services or to care by the patients, but at the same time that we can keep uh, this 
let's say, empathy and direct contact um, in, in the doctor-to-patient relationship, isn't it? Yeah. Mathilde, I, I think we, we are reaching the end uh, of this podcast, but I, I wanted uh, maybe to, to, to leave you an opportunity to say, to say a last word and maybe uh, have a forward-looking uh, consideration in, in uh, everything that we, uh, that we just discussed now. Yes, I think that we as neurologists have a role and uh, I think that uh, what came out is that despite the willingness, our patients risk to get discriminated. I think we have a role to have the voice in avoiding this and to do our best because uh, we are a community. This came out from COVID. So, and this comes out from my work every day with the WHO. I work in Italy, but I am part of a large family of people working with brain disorders and we have a role and uh, everybody needs a small uh, chat, can do something, I believe this and I thank you EBC for this because you are giving voice to many things and you're bringing innovation into the voice. So we are a community together, everybody needs its own computer, but everybody in his own computer, all together, we are many, many voices. I think that we can play a role, and neurology should play a role, because we have so many patients that need our voices. So that's my message. Thank you very much, Mathilde, for this, um, well, for your time and, and for this insight into the global efforts in addressing and understanding the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the brain, on brain disorders and uh, people living with these conditions. Um, thank you also to our listeners for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed this latest edition of our Brain Talks and we look forward to welcoming you back again very soon. Make sure to subscribe and follow us so you don't miss any of our new episodes and keep up with the latest via our social media channels. Goodbye.